Great. And what's the audience like? Is it just, um, I mean, I suppose you don't know everyone who listens to it, but people that are interested in politics or relatively not interested? Good question. We're starting. Good question. That's it. We're starting, right? Um, We're into it. So, no, audience-wise, well, predominantly Mm ex-military and serving military. I do get a proportion of non-military people listening to it out of interest, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that and that side of it's growing. I get people from all sorts of the world. I've got people in Japan listening, and it's a bit, a bit crazy. But so not not people g- generally interested. No, not that's wrong. Not interested in politics, but not educated in politics. I think about this on the way over. Um, when you, for me, when I was serving, I, I think you always have, you have to be apolitical. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, it can, I think it can impact your judge, your judgment definitely, and uh, and w- your belief in what you're doing. Yeah. So, uh, and I, it's the same in the same way that you, in the same way that I said on, on other previous podcasts, is that he, when you g- given a mission or whatever it is. Now, obviously, that'll be you got to think. Okay, is it ethically, mor- morally right? And I've, I've never been given a mission that wasn't. But in terms of the overall operation, let's take Afghanistan. Let's take Iraq, for example. You can't question why you're there. What should we be here mm-hmm. if you want to try and stay alive in the country at the same time? Because I think if you start thinking, well, should, why are we in Iraq or why are we in Afghanistan? Then you, your judgment becomes clouded. And on the lower end, even though the missions that you're doing are for um valid ethical moral purposes down on the bottom level you know clear the taliban out of a village or um or provide security so a school can be rebuilt for example mm-hmm. if you're questioning why you're there in, in in the first place in the whole country what's the whole point wh- who's pulling the strings blah 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 that can cloud your judgment and you you're more likely to come up in a box i think mm-hmm. um however so the reason i asked you on chloe and thank you very much for taking up the offer is as you know to to talk about brexit um i'm still trying to remain very much apolitical but as as time's gone on i sort of become more more aware of it and sort of understand it a bit more i'm talking about the last couple of years i'm 37 and you know i I was i was serving until i was 30 31 or 32 and i get out 10 11 or 30 so i got when i was 30 31 and only now we're sort of beginning to sort of understand politics um, but the Brexit thing is a mess uh, in terms of the presentation of information, how to mm-hmm. understand what's going on. So, can you give me a bit of your background, if you don't mind? I've just waffled yeah, the course. first ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I will <laughs> glance at my I will yeah. glance at my phone. I'm just keeping an eye on the time, and that's sure. it. It's not because you're boring me. I okay, <laughs> good to know. Good to know. <laughs> Go on for it, clock. Chloe. Your turn. Uh, well, my name's Chloe. Um, we met through Twitter which is how a lot of people meet these days. Um, Probably because you noticed that I tweet a lot about Brexit and politics. Um, I did campaign uh, for leave for for Brexit. Um, You might notice in my accent that I'm actually originally from Australia. So I was brought up in Brisbane, um, moved to the UK when I was 18 years old for university and um, stuck around for better or worse, depending on who you ask. <laughs> uh, and yes, I, I, I campaign for Brexit. I believe very strongly in it. Um, it for, for me, I was always very interested in politics. Um, I didn't know a lot about the EU until I moved to the UK and started to talk to other young people at my university about the EU. And they said it was very, very positive. Um, it was more of a cult. I think it was more of a cultural identity thing for them. What year was this? Sorry, this was uh, twenty twelve that I moved okay. over here, and so even though it wasn't part of the national conversation, it was still part of politics because UKIP were starting to become quite popular, and I was interested in that. I said, "What? What are they about? Why are they concerned about the EU?" And they would say, "Oh, you know, because they hate immigrants or, or this or that." But then I actually, um, through my political studies at university, started to read up a little bit more on this and. I read about the institutions, the way in which they write laws um, and the centralization of powers. And it made me very uncomfortable um, that there was this international bureaucracy 
that was taking away decision-making powers from national governments. And the justification for this was it's safer to be together, um, it's better for peace and prosperity, and it's good economically if decision-making power is taken out of the hands of the national governments and given to a central um, European government, essentially, in, based in Brussels, that can uh, write the rules for everyone in Europe. And that goes against everything that I thought the UK would be. This is, um, you know, the British Parliament is the mother of all parliaments because it's the parliament that was that my parliament in Australia is based on and parliaments in Canada and also democracies in the Western world all looked to Britain as a kind of guiding force. And I was very surprised that this was allowed to happen without too much approval at all from, from people in this country. So when the treaties were signed and the powers were given to Brussels, so for example, um, powers over trade policy, uh, over uh, many rules and regulations, including some taxes, uh, and also immigration. And these powers were handed over without any referendum or vote. Um, and, and politicians didn't really talk about it, in my opinion, enough to explain to people that it wouldn't be their MP that would have a say in these policies anymore. It would be an MEP. But the MEP wouldn't really be allowed to introduce legislation or have a big say. They would only be allowed to make minor adjustments. And if the other countries outvoted them, then Britain stuck with this this rule or this regulation. And so I, I thought that was, this was wrong. Um, and I do have British family here. And so I did feel an affinity to, to this country. And I, I knew that it would be um, difficult to take a side either way, to put yourself forward and say, I believe in X or Y. So at the time that um, we were leading up to the referendum, I was working then for a British uh, member of parliament and made the decision that even though it might not be likely that the Leafs I would win, I would just like to have it known um, in history that I stood on that side of the argument. And I was prepared for people to disagree with me, um, but I felt it was important to do something about it. Uh, and the vote was a complete surprise to, to me. Um, that was one of, th that night when the results started coming through, it, it was almost the first time I'd ever seen, ever felt like real change was really possible because there was this small team of us working in, you know, in Westminster, but predominantly outside of Westminster and in towns and locations across the country, leafleting, talking in the pub. And versus from our perspective, the British government, the civil service, um, the EU, the OECD, the IMF, all of these international institutions saying, this would be a terrible mistake. And lots of people in this country, the majority of the voting population saying, no, we want to we want to do this. We want to take a step back because we don't like the direction the EU is heading in. Uh, and it was such a positive day. That I think in London, the atmosphere was very eerie, but outside of London, in the areas which had a majority for leave, there was a sense of hope that things could really change. And now we're two over two years later uh, and I despair a little bit at what politicians have done with that vote so we had the largest democratic vote in British history for anything at all and then a general election where the two major parties Labour and the Conservative parties both said we respect this decision we're going to implement this decision and now I don't think we're anywhere closer, really, to any certainty about whether or not they real, will implement that decision. Oh, I'm and just getting so my notebook out. You keep talking, I'm just getting my notebook out. Ignore me. <laughs> so there's a, there's, a lot, there's a lot of uncertainty. So when you say, you know, talk about the Brexit mess, I think the mess has been politicians being unwilling to just decide, yes, we're going to do this. So you have you know, Labour saying, we're going to implement the result and now backing a second referendum. Uh, the Prime Minister saying that no deal's better than a bad deal, we'll be out of the single market and customs union at the election. That was central to her campaign. And now today, essentially saying that there's no chance we'll leave on a no deal. And also putting forward an agreement which doesn't really take Britain out of the EU's single market or customs union. So 
there are a lot of a lot of people that voted Leave that I campaigned with, just you know, normal people that aren't involved in politics, don't work in politics, that are almost in complete despair. That they, they, they you know, I think the the feeling is is anger and also hopelessness. Like, what do we do? Will decisions, if if we have a referendum in the future on something else, and politicians don't like the result, will they implement it? And it's bringing up all of these very difficult questions about the political system, about whether or not it is fit for purpose. Um, and I try to explain to my my friends who are predominantly pro-Remain, because I'm, I'm quite, still quite young, I'm in my 20s. Pro-Remain. Pro-Remain. And um, I say, well, if you if there is a vote in the future on something that you really, really care about and you think is really important, and the majority of people in this country, of voters in this country, vote for that decision. And the MPs turn around and say, we're not going to do that. There will be a precedent for that. And and is that something that you want to live with because you don't like Brexit? Um, so I think it's not a great situation at the moment. Um, and I, I, I do what I can through, through writing and, and coming on podcasts to try and explain to people why people why voters voted leave um why why i think it's a good idea but also to just try and hold politicians to account of what they promised to do because they promised to deliver this and if they don't then i'm really worried about trust in politics in this country mm. um well you're doing a good job of explaining it <laughs> i hope so feel free to ask any any questions because I, I i work in westminster where <laughs> we all have these terms that we just assume everyone knows no no <laughs> that's why i got my notebook out i think yeah. I, I should have i should have briefed you before we put the microphone microphones on you, you, you're talking to an ex-soldier now this is different you're gonna you're gonna knock it down a level <laughs> no no big words no i'm joking um so from, from from my back my my brexit background god almighty uh is uh, so i didn't vote either way and the reason being is i'm i i didn't feel i don't i generally don't vote at, at all um and that's because of a two things uh, a lack of trust in what politicians say they'll deliver on both sides whether you know well on all sides not both not just two sides there's more than conservative and labor you know lib dems and all the rest mm -hmm. of it a lack of trust in that but i also understand that's the game that's played it's just politics and but also I, um i didn't i don't vote generally because i have a lack of trust in the information that's given to me by the media who should I watch or listen to? Um, and I base that that question on who do I believe is 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 giving me the facts without without twisted information. And I don't think there's anyone that does that at, the, at this moment in time. No, no major news outlet anyway. Um, and so because of that that distrust in information I'm being given by by politics or by media, then I feel not informed enough to be able to especially with a referendum came by to be able to say to myself because that's a flipping big vote you know it's yeah, a big very decision important question is yeah. to, okay do i believe in, in remain or do, or, or do i believe in leave now at the time i was erring on the side of leave i think if i if it was law that we had everyone had to vote and i was made to vote i would have voted leave i think and the reason being is that there was a lot of the country there was a lot of as is now a lot of un unrest i think just sort of a sub a subliminal level of unrest in people general un un unhappiness so just a state of life uk just just generally unhappy you know and, and feeling like something could be done to fix it and i literally am back to all the same which a change is as good as the rest if we're unhappy where we're at now let's switch it up let's shake it up and see what happens um I also like that idea of leave because I thought, it, in the same way, I liked, in a way, the idea of Trump getting into power in the USA. Okay, there's a lot of negatives to it, right? And there's a lot of negatives to to leave as it, as it would be for remain. Okay, but the message that sends, like the the message it sends to our government, that people went stop. And vote and vote leave yes it's just over 50 percent, right but still I, half the country voted right just over half i voted again and voted to leave the message that sends to the government and the message it sends to other governments and other countries and people is that as you were saying you can you can if you got the minerals you can change things if you want you know and 
and, and uh, slightly sorry, slightly different to Trump that same message him getting the power was an indication of not what he is but the reasons he was voted for because people aren't happy with the norm they're not happy with it that was a that was a political thing they're not happy with it slightly different situation but sort of the same um and so where i'm at now is oh man it was always going to be a nightmare um difficult with such a close margin on the leave remain vote was it 51 point something to 48 point something was it percent something it's, like that yeah 52 percent but a majority of um over a million yeah i know so, i understand yeah, that yeah, yeah 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 um so where i'm at now is we voted we're done let's 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 just let's just get out right the problem i've got the most frightening thing for me now uh, and again i i'm not a, you know if, if some information came up uh, steer me towards remain i'm quite happy to change my mind i'm quite i will change my mind based on the information i'm given i'm not now hard and fast leave 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 i, I try and look at the information I'm present presented with which a lot of people don't do unfortunately a lot of people are very close-minded with it um based on what newspaper they read what whether they watch the bbc whether they watch sky you know it's it, that's how their, their minds their minds turn towards things um where was it going with that then where was it going with that? I think you're talking about your views on what should happen. Oh, now. right. So the most frightening thing to me is if a second referend referendum got called, uh, as you mentioned there, um, for the reasons you mentioned there, I think it would be catastrophic for the faith of British people on Remain and Leave side, both sides, if there's a second referendum called, because even the Remainers in their heart of hearts would think, okay, if we have a they just changed their minds on that. We voted mm. for something. They've changed, yeah, because now I favour the next time. I, and I think when I use the word catastrophic, I do think that it would result in riots and violence that we haven't seen before. I, honestly, honestly, I, I really think that. And one of the, and there's some unfortunate reasons with that. I mean, you know, people who voted leave, there's a, a significant proportion are very, very right wing. Um, and with that comes a lot of, you know, they're very active uh, very uh, yeah, activist approach uh that's the wrong words more there but I, I think they're just more prone to kicking up a right drama in the streets if 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 um if a second referendum is called i don't think it'll happen though i don't think a second referendum will happen i think the politicians and correct if i'm wrong i'm absolutely no expert which is why you're sat there i think that at the uh, at the top end in government they know that it would just it would be a disaster for them disaster for them because how could they ever be trusted again in whatever i think they do know that and the the timing of corbyn's announcement that he would support a second referendum he announced that you know labor would support this a bit too late on was it last so week? yes yeah. so really there isn't a lot of time so i i think from his perspective he wanted to show the remain side of his party which is the majority of mps and activists in the labor party that he was on their side but it really is too late. If he really believed in a second referendum, he would have called for this much sooner. So for that, I, there are also many Labour MPs who represent very large Leave constituencies who, even if it was Labour policy to vote for a second referendum, would be terrified of doing so because they know that their constituents will not accept them doing that. So I think the chances are very unlikely. But as you say, if it, if it happened, it would be very ugly. And I don't think it would be about the EU. I think if there was a second referendum, it wouldn't be about the merits of staying or leaving. It would be all about politicians in Westminster. And there are, were a lot of people who were distrustful, disenfranchised, had never voted for anything before in their life, already thought very low of politicians in general. And this has done nothing to improve improve the relations with those people I, in fact you have MPs standing up in parliament and making speeches about why people can't be trusted to make these kind of decisions why the general population don't have the information they need to make these kinds of decisions and I think that's quite insulting actually um, and I think in this country with in the political class there's an assumption that if you haven't been to university or if you don't have a PhD then you're somehow not as intelligible as those who have but i think there are lots of different kinds of intelligence i think that 
um, I mean, if you're a young person now, it's far more intelligent to actually do an apprenticeship because then you can earn while you learn as opposed to having all that debt. But I think people that run businesses that raise families on a, a low income that have to make very difficult decisions every day, that's a different kind of intelligence, uh, knowing how to fix things, knowing how to build things. Yeah. These are all other kinds of intelligence. And, you know, I'd like to see a, a journalist with a PhD um, you try to run a business one day. You know, everyone has different skills and abilities. And what it comes down to is making judgments about risks and rewards. And I don't think that people on average in this country are incapable of doing that. Um, I actually think, I think quite highly of people in general. That's why I'm a bit more of a capitalist than a socialist. I think people, it's better if they keep their own money because they make good decisions. They don't need a state to make decisions for them. So, the, yeah, the social cohesion element of a second referendum would be really bad. Um, and especially after two and a half years of all of these speeches from politicians saying, and also journalists and campaigners and celebrities talking about leave voters in very awful ways, saying all sorts of things. Um, I, don't, I think that's been quite damaging to social cohesion. This was an opportunity to repair and rebuild. And I think that alongside leaving the EU it was also a call for national renewal, for change, as you said. And we haven't seen any of that change. And I think that Theresa May, um, whilst I have a lot of respect for her resilience, and I think she's a good person who believes in what she's doing, I don't think she really believes in the change element. I think she'd like to have an arrangement with the EU, which is so something close to the status quo. <coughs> because from her perspective, she wants to avoid any disruption. But of course, staying very close to this institution, this, the EU, is also dangerous in itself because whilst there's a lot of uncertainty associated with leaving, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with staying. And one thing that your listeners might be interested in looking into for themselves, and I would encourage them to look into it for themselves and not just take my word for it, is um, the new defence relationships um, so uh, Macron and the new defence relationships. So the the European um, Defence Union, um, you know, PESCO, um, Common Defence Policy. That there are moves to centralise a lot of things in regards to defence, including uh, procurement. <coughs> the argument being that it's better if resources are pulled together. Um, and I I don't accept that argument. I think there's an argument for you know, nation states to have their own defence forces. Um, but also, there's already NATO. And what it appears to me is a situation, although I'd be interested to hear your thoughts or perhaps some other military experts on this, is that a, a European army, so to speak, would be essentially a duplication of NATO, but at the exclusion of America. And I do think that the the transatlantic partnership is actually very important um, and having a united front is very, very important. And I'm very concerned about that. And uh, I, I think we need more information about how much the British government has signed us up for in the future in terms of contributing to this defence force. For example, you know, will uh, British taxpayers be contributing to a budget for a European army or... Um, will certain decisions be made at the European level as opposed to the national level? These if are very we were to remain, you mean exactly. Yeah. Or e even if we have a half in half out approach, which Theresa May's deal I think is a half in half out approach. So in the withdrawal agreement that's currently being debated upon, there are some um, references to defence cooperation. They're quite vague, and it's not clear exactly what the British government has signed up for at this stage. Um, now, of course, the withdrawal agreement is different to the final arrangement. So the withdrawal agreement is an agreement to, to leave, have a transition period and keep negotiating. And then there'll be a final agreement at the end of those negotiations. It's important to state that it's not the final position. Um, but I think there's cause for concern. Yeah, that withdrawal agreement as well. The the length of time that, that would influence us all depends on how long we're allowed to withdraw. It could be ten years, couldn't it? C could be that long, couldn't it? Or is that, or is it a finite thing? 
it, the length of it the wasn't specified transition. as a finite transition no um look i think that if the negotiations took perhaps up to five years i it wouldn't it's not desirable to continue paying all that money and remaining in these institutions but if it did take that long to avoid as much disruption as possible and have a really solid trade agreement which meant that we've got that trading relationship sorted but withdrawing from all the political institutions i think most people would be happy with that um but it it could be a lot longer than that and as well there's no guarantee that at the end of the negotiations we would actually leave Mm -hmm. um i think that theresa may has handed the eu a lot of cards so this withdrawal agreement would allow at this point just still trying to renegotiate this with brussels but it would allow the eu if they were unsatisfied with uh, an arrangement with northern ireland it would allow the eu to uh, essentially keep the uk in the customs union and also have a lot of say over rules and regulations in this country Uh, and that is really i don't think that's a desirable starting point for negotiation saying to the other side that if they're not happy, they can keep us in some institutions. And so the UK would not be able to leave without the EU's permission, essentially. Doesn't sound like a very smart strategy. Um, and of course, the UK's big cards is money. Britain has a lot of money to offer, um, or she's already given that away at the start. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I, what, I, I don't what, know. What, what do you mean? Yeah. Well, so the the withdrawal agreement means that um, there'll be a thirty nine billion pound bill, which isn't really in return for anything other than permission to keep negotiating. So I would say that it would make sense to say that we'll pay this bill on the condition that we get an agreement. But the withdrawal agreement says that the UK gov the UK taxpayers will give forty billion pounds. Um, so that we can keep on negotiating and maybe we'll get an agreement one day. Hmm. Yeah, someone didn't go to negotiation school, did she? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, advisors, I don't know. Um, it's going back, going back, because I completely down, I skipped over it. Um, yeah, the, EU, the EU army, yeah. Mm. That's an interesting one. I, I'm no, I'm no military expert, not not a, a strategic. Yeah, level and I wouldn't anyway. pretend to be either. So that's why I think that your listeners should look into this um, mm. for themselves. There's a website called Veterans for Britain um, with some research papers, but also links to the um, original sources. So you can look and see the at the, the original sources of the notes of meetings, um, what the EU have put forward essentially as a proposal. So you can see the facts. There is there are some um, people that think this is a good idea, and maybe there is an argument from from their perspective for a European army. But I don't think it's fair to take Britain into one without telling people about it first or having those arguments out in the open in in an election. Yeah, I mean the EU army thing. I think it's, it's, it's not that it's short term, but it's a bit of a, I think it's a bit of a, one of the scaremongering terms that's come out. It would obviously wouldn't be a you know an army sat somewhere waiting to go on called the EU army it'd be it'd be like you were saying earlier like a pool of resources so I don't know I would kind of imagine it being for example that every country would have a percentage of their armed forces on a standby of some level um ready to go and do the EU's bidding um I, uh, I've got a problem with that in that I'm not saying that's what it would be but <clears throat> the EU would call a lot of the shots in what the potential operations and missions could be but um, my my one p- problem with that that pops into my head is uh, the unelected would be call- would be the unelected EU Parliament. You know, would be they're unelected, aren't they? Really? So the Parliament is elected, but they have very little influence. So who are the unelected? That, that so it would be about? the the leaders and uh, so you know, John Claude Juncker. Um, all these figures yeah. negotiating, but there, right. yeah, there's lots and lots of bureaucrats making decisions right yeah. now on behalf of. British and people. if we've got NATO, why do we need another EU force? As you as you quite rightly pointed out, um, uh, uh, there are positives to it because that's the why we've got NATO, mm. right? There are positives to it. Um, they also they also big negatives. It's just it's just, a, it's, just a, it's just another uh, it's just another bit of power and leverage, which is that the EU would get to to leverage other 
other nations, other countries, internal and external, to, to just go with what what they want, really. Um, which is I can't I can't really see why else they would they would feel they need it from a defense perspective when you got NATO. I don't I don't really understand it. Um, the going back 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 again. So things pop into my head, and then I I went I remember them. <laughs> You reminded me of something when you were talking about uh, the shock you had when the vote happened. Um, oh, the the result was announced. Not when the vote happened. The result was announced, and you shock at it being, holy moly, the the Lee, you know the Lee was won. Um, I experienced different to this, so I was it was to me it was, that was it, that's what was happening, um, and there was someone else. I, I've got a a, fr- a a couple of friends here. I've got quite a few friends in London. But the couple of friends, their 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 um, fiance and fiance, they get married this year, and one of them is ex-military with me, with me, served with me, um, and his background is not dissimilar to my own. You know, uh, grew up in sort of working class, you know. and his his partner, she, I hope she doesn't listen. She won't mind me saying <laughs> it. I'd say is upper middle upper middle class. Um, I'm so him and I be like yeah so good not, i'm not surprised that r- leavers won the vote because that's what we were so all we were immersed in in our social circles and professional circles was people mostly saying how oh, they wanted out mm-hmm. and then she was uh, she was disgusted she couldn't believe it she thought that things had been rigged and oh mm-hmm. my god i can't believe no way everyone wanted to vote remain and we, and we you know we, we had a had a joke where we said yeah you know no you didn't I, and where she lives is uh, where she's from is quite an affluent area it's not in london it's just outside of london and we was, um, and we were saying to her and one of the things we said was how, how bad your immigration problem down in uh you know is there a lot of people do you get a lot of immigrants down where you live no i'm not saying immig- <coughs> immigration is the the reason for leave but we're going back to that um presentation of information and, and how the whole thing came about in the first place with people being happy now I had a bit of a light bulb moment just now, which you probably had about two years ago. <laughs> and it's that it the, I, I I would love to see the demographic breakdown of people who voted. And I'm gonna suggest that the majority of people who voted remain. And I I am this is a broad brush, mm-hmm. and I'm going to suggest, I'm guessing, the majority of people who voted remain, there was a higher percentage of those remain voters were were so in general, Remain voters were better off, when I say better off, better jobs, better money, living in better areas, than the Leave voters. And I'm going to suggest that. And the reason I'm saying it is, based on this one this one little thing in my head, when you're in a good place, when your business is thriving, when you're happy in life, when you've got money, when you're doing what you want to do, the last thing you want to do is shake it up. You don't want anything to change because you're happy. You, you don't want anything to change. So... I would argue you're going to vote remain, and then you got on the leave side. You vote, you vote for change because you ain't happy with where you're at for whatever reason that is, and you can attribute that to you can yeah you know, your life can be a mess. You say well it's immigrants taking the jobs or, or whatever's being said, whatever whatever narrative is being thrown out in the media, right? And that's what you're going to go with. And then you're going to vote re- uh, leave because you want to change it up. Now, going back to the question of a second referendum and the catastrophe that would cause. That's a, what I'm talking about. There is a, is that's a div, uh, the difference between two significant sets of classes: people who are well off and people who aren't. You know, and and uh, going forward, if that second referendum came again, that's that division of classes itself. That that would be the that would be the battle. You know, uh, when I use that that word in no uncertainty as to what it means but that's what it could be it could be a, a, a class war like we've you know not we've not, not seen before i don't know I, 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 but i i'd agree with your assessment um it's it you can't tell for sure exactly how people voted after a referendum but a lot of the polling showed exactly what you suspected which was they don't collect demographics no, they can't they, can they, they do no. they do surveys afterwards but of course you can't account for people you know being forthcoming with information yeah. but all of the all of the research indicates that, that you're right that there was a class divide um and there was a lot of snobbery after the vote in my opinion 
um, there was one struck out to me. It was I think it was a Huffington Post or a BuzzFeed article where they went through the different favorite brands of Leave versus Remain voters. And they said Remain voters on average prefer Apple products and all these fancy things. How do they know and that? It was, I think it was just a poking fun kind of article. Oh, right. <laughs> but they, I think they did a survey and they said, and Leave voters like things like baked beans and like really, really trying to mock this and say, you know, Leave voters, oh, they're so stupid and, and they're poor and they buy baked beans. And I was disgusted. And, and I felt like saying, of course, of course, Leave voters on average you know, of course, people that were worse off voted leave because the EU wasn't working for them. Like, why can't you get that through your head? Uh, and by writing these articles and, and mocking people that actually don't really have a voice. So you have these celebrities with you know, massive Twitter accounts and, and, and TV shows and radio shows and everything. And they go around mocking, you know, 52% of the voting population. How are those people supposed to respond? You know, you're using your platform to kind of bully and belittle people who don't have any way of talking back to you. It undermines the value of the, 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 opinion, the opinions of those people. And I'm one of those people, you know. Um, those people. As in <laughs> flipping working class. You know, it's like, I, yeah, I, I, it's... Um, the opinion is valid, you know. Here's the, the problem with... with uh, being successful and being in and um, walking in certain circles like that, right? Is that you tend mm, sometimes you can tend to think you know it all, and especially at the top, especially the uh, financial experts, experts in inverted commas, and the political experts, and uh, whatever else. Tend, you know, the, the Jacob Re Reese Moggs and the like. I've got nothing against him. But you can tend to think you know it all. And the one thing I've come to the conclusion is that from a numbers game, talking about Brexit, the money we're going to save, the money we're going to, um, you know, lose, commerce, trade, bills to the EU, it's impossible to work it out. There's too many variables. There's too many variables, right, to try and, try and, to try and work out how much we're going to save a day or a month or a year or this, that or the other, or how, how much trade is going to be impacted. I think it's impossible to work out. But it's also very, very easy to pick and choose your numbers that you like and, 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 misre and, and throw them out as a misrepresentation of what you think is going to happen. You, you skew the numbers to match what your what your opinion is remain or leave right um and even then we don't let's say we could we could work out um we could work out how much better or worse it's going to be for us when we when we when we exit when we exit uh it's impossible then to compare that to what it would be if we had stayed in you just don't know you don't know and uh, so for that, that and then that well that's one of the main reasons i think look we've 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 pulled the plug now we've pulled the pin this is this is get out right i'd pref i would prefer no deal i would i i'd prefer a deal sorry not no deal i just would because you don't want to burn too many bridges right but as you were saying it's very it can be very it could be very dangerous and sort of almost go against what the, the referendum is all about to have too many agreements with them and, and still be beholden to the eu in some way shape or form um yeah I, I i so you cast the numbers aside because you can't it's impossible it's too complicated no one can work out cast that aside what are you left with in terms of well should we remain or should we leave because i still you know question it some i still question it because i'm still not 100 percent. you know i'm 100 percent behind that we voted and we should leave but whether it's going to be wholly good or bad we're well, not wholly good or bad, better good than bad but going back to your point right at the start. If we cast the numbers aside because we don't know what we're left with, what what's left to base your decision on. Well, it should be. It, it, I think the first thing that people should vote on, and I said this to my dad right at the start when he had to go at me for not voting. <laughs> um. Uh, I think what people should vote on with anything, with anything, because of that misrepresentation of information in the media, difficult to understand politics and all the numbers. 
And this goes for future votes. I really think that people should be look at the part. Let's say it's a, um, a vote for the next PM, right? Um, a general election. And I think should, people should look at it and go, okay, what, what does that person stand for? What are their parties here they're going to do? Now, how does that impact me, my life, like really impact it? Me and where I live. Not how is how do the media say it's going to impact me? Like the immigration, like the immigration thing. You know, we talk, I talked to my dad about that, and he lives in a, in a place called Crinan, South Wales, in a village. You don't get many immigrants in a in a, in a Welsh Valley village. You don't. You know, I mean, the, the, I remember when the I remember when the first uh, we had a Muslim move into the village, and his wife, I think he's Muslim. Anyway, he's non-Christian and he's got darker coloured skin, and he's not African. Right, so I think, I think he's Muslim. Jazz, his name is. Um, run local shop, and it was you know like oh, proper Welsh bigotry. Who, who was this guy? And then over time, it was mm. got it was fine, you know. He's and he's a, a nice guy, but it doesn't really affect him in in where he lives. My dad, you know, and 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 those people in that village, immigration doesn't. So, but they, I think they probably all voted. Leave to be honest, I may be wrong, but my point is voting on what you how you see it affecting you. Really think about it, and then you can and then you can you can make a, a good sound judgment based on what you know it how it know it affects you and, and not not what you're being told. You know, think mm-hmm. about it. Um, how did I get onto that? A white waffle. <laughs> I I think you're so right about you can never in any decision in your life on anything know for certain outcome of this decision versus that decision that we can't you know the the treasury makes forecasts but they don't know with any certainty what the economics will be either way so i All think the forecasts I think, are different as well yeah the forecasts are different depending on you talk to it this is you know it's like so i think it comes down to a principle i i think the the vote it had to come down to the, the principle whether or not you believe in it and i think it's about taxation and representation very very simple principle the, the whole campaign was about control and who is in control of your destiny and the destiny of your country and i believe very strongly that if you're going to give half of your income to the state or perhaps a third if you're on a, a much lower income if you're going to give all that money to people to spend on your behalf you should have a say over how that is spent and what they do with that money and that is what to me democracy comes down to no representation no taxation without without representation and i think the eu is moving further and further towards taxation without representation spending your money and making decisions good or bad whether or not you agree with them or not but you having no way to influence those decisions i think that is, i think that is wrong and what's really interesting is, is after the vote, um, I worked with a group called Change Britain, which was with uh, led by Gisela Stewart, the Labour MP, who's a German Labour MP, campaigned for, for Brexit. And we were speaking to people across the country about the vote. And um, I won't mention her name or where she was from, but I, I remember very strongly um, someone, a lady who w- clearly didn't have, and she said she didn't have a lot of money at all. Um, and she said, you know, she th- she really believed I could lose my job. This is what they were telling me. The treasury were telling me. Everyone was telling me I, I could lose my job, and things could get much worse for me. But I was thinking in my mind that I want my kids to live in a democratic country, and that summed it up for me when she said that. That I think summed up a lot of the feeling from from people. It was, it was about a principle, because you're right. We can't know with any certainty which way the EU is going could get a lot better for all we know they could get much more democratic um and we don't know with any certainty exactly what the future relationship will be like in the future and what's going to happen in the global economy and whether it's worth stepping out and and doing trade deals with it with america and asia but i think that principle is very important and i think it's important to a lot of people and um i'm worried that if if there is that second referendum or we remain that that principle will be betrayed though people will be taxed without having any say over how that money is spent yeah and, and this is how a lot of kind of revolts have happened in human history you know, think about all these revolutions of people saying hang on uh you know it used to be kind of 
the monarchy. Um, why are you taking away all my money? Um, what are you doing with it? You know, that's that's my income because we talk about tax as if it's uh, money, as if it's this imaginary thing. But if you think about it, that's your time and your labor, your energy. You know, forty forty percent of everything that you put out into the world. If you if you're taxed at forty percent of your on your paycheck, that's like you know four days out of ten of your work you're just working for these other people you should have a say over what happens as a result of that mm. uh, go, going i remember where i was it's like yeah you're absolutely fine um you should have a say on it and and the the, the buck of power the buck of power that's <laughs> my saying the buck of power should stop as close to home mm. as possible i'm by that i mean the Prime Minister of the UK, because um, uh, if I've interpreted what you how you're saying that the EU works, right? I'm an ex soldier. I'm, I'm, I'm slowly processing this information. Um, is that PM UK is beholden to the EU for certain things? You got the EU Parliament and they're voted in, and then above them you got the the EU leaders who who, have, who hold most of the power and the. And all, all of the MEPs can do, and therefore the nation states can do, is have a little influence on changing some minor things in different documentation and, and rules and, and regulations, right? Well, then the buck, of, the buck of power is right at the top. It's so far from the UK, so far from the British people, that there's a huge disconnect. And so you end up with things like, like uh, rules and regulations or, or directives that come in that are great for most other countries but not good for the UK, or vice versa, or vice mm -hmm. versa, right? Um, and so, in in that same note, when I was talking just now, ranting about the Welsh village, um, in that, you know, you, you, you should you should base a vote on, I, said, I think I said two things, and one is, how does it really affect you? And two, um, and two, so when it comes to the, the Remain Leave vote, base it on democracy, as you said. Now, and, and that being, you want you, a democracy should be as democratic as possible, surely, you know. And and talking about the EU again, there and the leaders, it just seems to get less democratic up the tree. And there's more, there's more scope for corruption and bribery and all those things that happen anyway from. A local business, you know, on the high street, to all the way up to the top. And the, the more that you can remove, the better. The more honest it be, the less dishonest it becomes. <laughs> the less dishonest <laughs> it becomes, you know. Um, so yeah, the, I, hasn't Boris Johnson just changed his his figures on how much the was it is it how much money they're going to save per week and be able to put to the NHS? It was a three hundred and fifty. Is it three hundred and fifty billion? That you said at the start. So the, and, yeah, so and the, now it's four hundred and thirty eight or something. Well, <laughs> so the, the contribution fees have gone up. So the the amount of money that the British government is sending to the European Union every year has gone up since the vote. And so the amount of money sent to the EU every week has risen. So I believe How do they work it out then? Over four over four hundred million. How do they work um, out how much we should pay? A, a proportion of um uh, GDP. I believe so. Okay. Um, so I think at the time of the referendum, I believe the gross figure was about 12, 13 billion. Um, although I'll have to go back and check that it's been a little while since I've, I've made these arguments. Um, but I think the budget, the budget now has definitely increased because, um, it's been increasing for other countries as well. And when, the, when the UK leaves, there'll be a huge hole in the EU's budgets. Um, and I'd be very happy to send the EU some ideas about how they can save money. For example, fuel limousines <laughs> and champagne receptions. <laughs> well, but, we do that but, as well. Yeah, yeah. But the, the British politicians have a harder time getting away with it because they've always got the press yeah. and, and the voters. Um, but I, I don't think there's as much scrutiny of that kind of thing when it's at an international yeah. level. Um but yeah, there's a lot, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. There's this big um, disagreement in the campaign about the 350 million number. So 350 million is, well, it's actually about 362 million a week, but we rounded it down, is the gross contribution. So the total n uh, amount of money set aside for EU, for the EU. But there is a rebate. 
and there is um, money spent on project EU projects in the UK. And so the Remain side argued, well, we are we're not sending this money away for nothing. We get some of it back. But the important thing it was about control. It's like yes, yes, they send it back, and yes, they send us a rebate. But the British government isn't in control of that. Um, and so that is the important, I think that was the important um, message of that of that number. And what's really interesting is people, as you said, you didn't, you didn't really remember whether it was million or billion. People, when polled, <laughs> don't remember whether it was 100 or 350 million. All they remember is that it was a lot of money. Um, and that's the important point. It's a lot of money being sent. And that's, that's, that's our money. Um, is that the general, is that, sorry, so that, is that the, is that like a that's what that's the general overall bill we pay, the membership fee we pay to the EU. Yes. Right. And there's there's apart from like tariffs on trade and I don't know what else that the little bits and add-ons fees here and there you chuck in you know like uh, you know you go you go all the way through you go with, you're buying something online you go all the way through and you go twenty quid and then, and then you get the next bit oh and there's a VAT on top oh and then there's a postage. Oh, and then you have to send it through a code. To, you know, get all the money ad- adds on and adds on. So apart, apart from what we're talking about, so apart <laughs> from that, three hundred and fifty million. That there's nothing else. Bill, you know, direct money wise, that's what we pay. That, that's that's the total a total gross number. Three fifty. Yeah, it was it's above three fifty million now a week. So, oh, okay. So, so the argument then, the remain argument then, like, it must be based around. It can't be based around that then. That's you can't really argue that number. But it must well, they, be based around that yeah, so they, and how much we're going to lose. So they argued, they argued that because trade, th- it, that some of that money was then from the EU given back to the UK. They argued that how much of it? Um, about half. Okay. So about half, and and but um, there's still over a hundred million a week that the UK sends and doesn't see ever again, and. That was the really important message that we were trying to put across. Like, this is a lot of money every week, and it should the people who decide how that money is spent should be elected by you and accountable to you. And it's that five that billion was a year, argument. right? Five point two billion a year. Am I working that out right? It's, it's more than that. I think yeah, about I think it's closer to thirteen billion um, in gross contribution, but in in, in net contributions, okay. that'd be a, a smaller number. So, so there's a big, this big, the biggest thing about from the Remain campaign saying, look, you should say the net contribution. But I think even the net contribution fee is a lot of money. Mm. So the net contribution is the money that is sent and never seen again. Still a lot of money. When I think about um, the financial side of things, <clears throat> you got that, which is pretty much it's about, it's about as black and white as you're going to get with with um, with the EU, UK money. But then, what is not black and white, as you mentioned? Yeah, you know, that's um, how 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 much are we going to lose or gain through trade? How much are we going to lose or gain through, you know, even j- just things like our, our reputation as a country? Now, I'm not being a member of the EU, maybe being perceived as sort of a bit un, a, a little less stable than we were beforehand, and then people less likely to do deals with us from see from private companies to, you know. So other countries want to engage with us. You don't know if it's going to be positive or, ne- or negative. Um, I had a point there. Two seconds. Where was it? Let me think back. Where's it going with that? Trade. Oh man, hang on. It was a. It was. It was a remain thing. I think I was going to go on to. Yeah, the, for, for on that on that trade perspective, I do perhaps think that we're going to be we are going to be worse off maybe on on the trade side of things. So commerce, how how is business going to be affected? How you know um our ex- export and imports. That's where I was going. So how how much how valuable are we as a country in our exports? So if we pulled out the EU, right? When we pull out the EU. How of the, of the things we export now to whatever countries? One, um, well, how much of that can be gotten from uh, from other EU states? How much of that business are we going to retain? Is our export value? Is our exports still going to be remain the same value? I, I don't know. That's it. So that's my only that's mm-hmm. my only question. I I don't I don't feel like the UK as a 
has that many uh, has products that we can flog that they can't people can't get elsewhere well so the uk is one of the eu's biggest customers in terms of buying from the eu so from eu business's perspective it's good to have a good relationship in terms of exports i mean there are a few things that the uk really excels at um one of them is education um another is services industry uh pharmaceuticals and technology which of course is where the world is heading um i think the prosperity of british business and therefore how much they're exporting to the world and how much money they're making it depends on the policies that are put in place after or even before brexit i think what is important is having um business friendly policies making it easy to do business in this country but also having simple taxes and i say simple as opposed to lower because one of the one of the biggest impediments to to business growth from the businesses that i speak to is the complicated tax system how complex it is how difficult it is to interact with hmrc and also the fact that there are new changes every year and it's very difficult to keep up with it so they spend a lot of time of, of their business just trying to keep up with all these regulations and compliance if the uk adopted a simpler tax system and ideally lowered some taxes this would make britain one of the best places to do business in europe if not the best place to do business in europe and actually a lot of eu leaders have said that they are worried and afraid that the british government might do this because then it might make more sense to base your business in britain than in a european country like for example france where you're going to get hammered with very high taxes lots of eu regulation so there is actually a fear on the continent that britain will actually thrive outside of the eu if it adopts those policies the simpler um, policies yes yeah, simpl- simpler and lower taxes how um, how do they recover that money elsewhere though how would, so yeah. th- so there's so it, it could basically comes down to economic arguments so whether you, so there is one school of thought and this is this is what i believe that if you lower taxes then businesses keep more of their money and then they invest that back into their business improving their products employing new staff um investing in growth and and that is how the economy grows and a growing economy is good for government finances because the more businesses there are the more people working the more taxes you're taking in um and i just really do believe that as well not just in terms of not we just want to make money the reason why i'm very pro business is because i think businesses solve problems i think entrepreneurs see a problem with the way something is done and they think of a solution and it makes our lives better i think of all the advances in technology over the last even just 10 years um our lives are getting better and improving and i think a lot of that is down to really intelligent people finding solutions to problems and they can't do that if there is an environment which makes it very very difficult to start and run a business um and so i i i really do think that businesses get a bit of a bad rap these days um there's lots of kind of anti anti business sentiment and i think that's probably because you have a lot of corporatism um which is when businesses get to a certain size um they do they are able actually to avoid a lot, quite a lot of tax because if you're a huge corporation you can afford a team of lawyers and accountants to find the loopholes in the tax system and i think th- people see that and think that business is bad but i think that i think corporatism so the big corporates give business in general a bad name yeah i i agree with you i've got i <coughs> i've got no issue with those that that loophole finding if it's legal because well, i've got no issue with it it's legal and as a business you do what you, as a as a, a legitimate you know honest integral business you do what you can to do to legally make your business thrive i've got no issue with it regardless of the size of corporation whether it's google or facebook or whatever go on register in ireland go on it means cheaper it means cheaper um it means cheaper, less taxes for you, or whatever, however, whatever it may be, you know, less taxes for you. And then, like as you were saying, guess what? The business is going to thrive even more. And you can employ more people. You can pay more people. You can, if you're a technology company, you can push forward the, the R&D you're doing. It, it, it's of a benefit. Um, going back to that simplifying tax and, and lowering tax, 
um, you know, one of the things it would do with the business would thrive, it'd also attract more business to the country. Absolutely. Um, the problem with, as you know, the, the problem with uh, adopting that kind of approach, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's very difficult to measure the outcome in the short term or to predict what the outcome would be. You know, look, we're going to lower tax and get more business in. Business is going to thrive. People are going to be more productive. They're going to be paid more and more entrepreneurialism. But you to put that into figures it's a, as a as a like a, a genuine forecast is really difficult. And so to persuade people is really difficult with it. Um, I'm just trying to think about what other countries have adopted that. Any other countries adopted that model? Um, so you might have heard about the Singapore model. So Singapore have they have a really simple tax system um, and quite low taxes. They also, however, don't have a lot of protection for workers' rights. And so when we talk about the Singapore model, I would like, Brit I think Britain should adopt a lot of the tax system and the, the lower taxes, but I don't think Britain should compromise on, on workers' rights, things like you know, weekends and, and time off and maternity leave. Um, and I think it's right that you know, the Prime Minister has said that as a result of leaving the EU, we're not really going to scale back on any of that, all of the workers' rights and, and, and those things. I think that that's quite important. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a good tax system. I think America has a good system where things are very devolved. So you talk about decisions being made closest to, to home. Different, ta uh, different states in, in the United States are able to set their own tax rates. And so it's great. You can actually see the results of different policies in action. Um, one state lowers taxes, more businesses move there, more, more people want to live there, the economy is going very well. Um, and you can kind of see how different tax policies work and, and democratically choose to live in a state where maybe they have higher taxes and but that you know, more public services. And so I think more devolved taxes, so more local powers to raise taxes would be a good thing at the moment about i think over 90 percent of tax in this country is raised centrally so it goes all down to whitehall in in westminster and i don't think that centralization on such a mass scale is very productive um i think that it's very difficult to to plan things and to run things from a central you know i think the further centralized things get the more difficult it is to, to be agile and, and change with, with, with things. So I, th I think more devolved powers for local councils um, to, to raise money more locally and spend it more locally, I think that would be a really good thing. I think then you would see as well an improvement in, in local public services because at the moment things are very centrally run and I don't think that's the best way of running things. I think you need to, I think you need to have things more local so that you can respond very quickly to, to changes. Mm -hmm. so we're getting, we're getting very into tax policy this is great but tell me if i'm boring you, you it's, like white, <laughs> it's like white noise to me i haven't understood a thing for the last 20 minutes i'm so <laughs> sorry <laughs> i'm such I'm a joking. dork you no, know at, at the pub i'll be talking about this and my friends will be like chloe just you know it's shh <laughs> it's, not with it's, nice. it's, it's, it's per perfect. perfect it's an education <laughs> um what do you think about just slightly off Mm -hmm. What do you think about minimum wage? Mm. Should there be a minimum wage? I think there should be. Um, and I've read a little bit into this, but th there is a limit to the rate at which you can raise it without putting making businesses go out of business, essentially. So there are a lot of arguments to, to raise the minimum wage. Um, and they I think they come from a good place. It sounds very good. We want people to be paid more. Um, so the state should mandate that they're paid more. Not very good if it gets to the point where like a local cafe just can't afford to pay their wages anymore and, and then they close down. Well. Or, yeah, or, yeah, and it stifles yeah. growth. And there's a very, so Dennis Prager, one of my in, you know, people that I learned from, he has a great podcast. Um, I don't agree with him on every, any, everything, but he, he made a really good point on the minimum What's wage. What's his name? Dennis Prager. Dennis? Dennis Prager. He's an American, very charismatic, very funny. What's his surname? Prager, P R A G U R. Okay. And he said that um, he talks about the left as if there is this one entity, but he said, you know, <sighs> the left sometimes believe in feeling good, not doing good. If we put up the minimum wage or we campaign for that, it makes us feel good. 
it'll put but does it do good put businesses out of business that, that doesn't do good but it feels good and and that I think really hit the nail on the head where sometimes a policy sounds or feels good but it doesn't always do good and we should make decisions based on what we can observe does good I think um I, I initially thought there shouldn't be a minimum wage um when I say initially, I'm talking the last last eighteen months when all of a sudden I've become a political expert in the pub. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um I initially thought no, but then I thought, okay, well it leads to exploitation and how do you how do you prevent businesses that are growing who are able to pay a minimum wage? Uh, who are able to pay a, yeah, what would be around about a minimum wage to workers? How would you how would you make sure it's done? And maybe because that's my main issue with it, stopping people getting exploited. But at the same time, you know, we were talking about there the the the, the pros about the, the the cons about having a minimum wage. It can it can close businesses down if you raise too high too quickly. Um, it can stifle growth. As you're saying, you know, um, a, a business who's a, a business that's ready to expand to the sort of I don't know. Let's say it's a, let's say it's a um, trouser. I don't know. Shorts manufacturer, towel manufacturer. You know, a couple of machines in making towels. And someone's dishing them out, and the demand's gone through the roof, and they're sort of at the cu- at, at the at the cusp of well, they, they, they're at capacity of what they can produce and, s- and send out the door and sell. And to move forward, need to hire, get another get another person, hire another person in, but to get another person, in, then they're running at a loss, and and it would take too long to to make the return on investment any valuable. So they just stay where they are and, and annoying customers because they can't get the towels out the door quick enough and then bad reviews mm-hmm. and then the business shuts down like you're saying um but what about if so if there was no minimum wage or, or there was a minimum wage right but there was criteria to it it wasn't hard and fast for business so you could say all right you can you can pay work you can pay your employees whatever you want right but and there would be some guidelines on what would then be exploitation, but the main factor that would prov- that would dissuade you from exploiting your workers would be okay. When your business reaches a level where your your net profit is, let's say, fifteen percent or twenty percent, let's say your net profit hits tw- is twenty percent. You know, you turn over your your net profit is twenty percent, right? Then at that point. Now you're minimum wage. Now you 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 you're making enough. You've got the there's a margin in there. Now you must hit that minimum wage bottom end. So it allows the smaller companies to grow first year, two years, where they're really making nothing. They're breaking even, and employ people who are willing to work for peanuts. Being part of mm-hmm. a, I don't mean for peanuts, being for being part of a you know a, a growing business, new business, and and they, and they're willing to earn money. Maybe it's a part time job, and knowing that at the point that that company reaches they got a name 20 percent. then they just got to minimum wage and and that and their employer is beholden to that and if they don't then they get thrown in jail the punishment has to be hard as well to prevent that expectation i don't know maybe maybe that's a an easy solution to it because I, I agree with you the, the, the pros are, are massive for not having it it's just people will take the mick yeah and and i am someone who you know, considers my, i consider myself a conservative um but i also think i owe a lot to a lot of left-wing campaigners throughout history and trade unions who fought for things like the weekend, um, maternity pay. Um, I, I think these things were actually really important. I think we need a left and a right. I think we need people like me who go out there and say, yes, business, we need to grow the economy. But we also need those people on the other side of politics who are constantly saying, yes, but what, a, what about if you're at the bottom and you're just starting out? You know, let's Let's make sure we... And I think there is a balance between making sure that it is easy and um, rewarding to start a business in a, in, a, in a society, but also making sure that you don't have exploitation. Um, people aren't taken advantage of. I'd, I'd worry about at this point, at this stage, we have free movement. If there were no minimum wage laws and companies could pay whatever they like, I think you would see a lot of a lot of people come, moving here from countries where the um, wages are much lower where in the UK the wages comparable to their home country would be higher but comparable to the money you need to raise a family in this country much lower I'm concerned that 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 kind of thing might happen 
Um, and this is why there's a lot of resentment in, in the United States. Um, you know, I've, I've watched a lot of interviews. I've been trying to understand why there's so much popularity for the for the wall, the idea of the wall, and um, you know, where is this coming from? And in a lot of the southern states, I've been watching interviews with, with people who are saying that they, there aren't jobs there and that there are, you know, illegal immigrants coming over and you know, taking the jobs. And it sounds very cliche, but in some cases, businesses just exploit people that way and that because they know that people will be willing to work for that low wage and I don't think that's right um and yeah so I I think in politics we need to find you know, the balance between the you know my, my libertarian friends who say there should be no laws and no regulations but also the my socialist friends who say uh, the state must mandate everything and have very strict rules and regulations um and it's interesting politics is pretty much just a fight between the two between people that say the state should have more power and people that say individuals should have more power and in britain we've got a mixed economy we've got a bit of state and a bit of individualism mm. <clears throat> going back to i mean you're so conservative i, I don't i don't like the labels I don't yeah, like the label. i hate it i actually think they're becoming a bit out outdated the left and right thing i think that's outdated what i see in politics is um s state and individual status versus individualists like what do you mean so i think that politics so as far as i've observed is constant arguments about how far the collective power should go the state power versus the power of individuals to make their own decisions and so I think that's, in, I don't know what you would call it, but I think the level at which you, the, the size you think the state should be, that's the, that's the big gap between, I think, people in politics. I, uh, oh, sorry, when I'm, when I'm in the labels, I, I yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't like the fact there's parties. I don't, I hate it. I don't like the, f I, I, because it's that team thing and people tend to stay on the same team because that's their team, regardless of whether they're, this doesn't quite fall in with what they think or not. I, I, my, my opinion is it, sh it shouldn't be there. Uh, obviously that's where we are now, it's just the way the country's evolved. Um, but it should just, it sh it's just a spectrum of where you sit on what, you know, where, what you're thinking on that particular day. And I'm, I'm sort of slightly left of centre. Well, I'm, I'm not Labour, I'm not Conservative. Um, I don't, and you know, I might think in the next general election. Well, actually, I like what the Conservatives been uh, saying. I think I might vote for them. It's unlikely I'd vote mine, Chloe, but I think I might <laughs> vote for them. But then the following year, I might think I'm completely open to change my mind. I think when you have the labels and the parties, it, it closes people down, and you, and you end. And you're not getting the honest reply from the whole of society when you get your votes, and it, 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 on an honest. You're not getting an honest vote from everyone. They vote because that's their team. I'm going to vote for because I'm going to vote for Lib Dem. I'm going to vote for UKIP, whatever. Interesting. But um, I've got another, you're going to have to come back on again for a little spin off I'm doing, right? Because uh, we've got about five minutes left. Yeah. Um, I have my last podcast I did was last week. My dad had my dad on, right? Now, he came on for a different reason. Um, but we, my first podcast was not Hey Chama. It was in his, my dad's shed, in that, in Crinant, and uh, it was called, we did one episode, <laughs> and I set it up, and we had, I set, I recorded it on two mobile phones, so I had a mobile phone pointing at him, and mm -hmm. a mobile phone pointing at me, and we had little lapel mics on, and at the end I spent about two hours, three hours putting the two things together, you know, just cropping mm -hmm. it down, and so, on the video, we were talking to each other. And it was called, I can't remember if I said it, the name of the podcast is Colonising Mars, right? And it came about of a discussion, um, and a thought that I had, that I'd heard on another podcast a few times, the Joe Rogan podcast. I love the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah. yeah? It's great. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see what time. It's so long so, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and he's mentioned it a few times, and Joe's feeling that the american senate american politics it's comp it's just based on mentalness you don't need to do that anymore have that have that have politics the way it is and to have democracy the way it is right and i was thinking about that with the uk i think 
100 percent agree it, you know we, we do things now we got we, we got the, you know the government now because it's based on forms of communication that we did or didn't have hundreds of years ago you know we have mps because the m the mp would go from local town listen to what they everyone wanted go okay and then go to london and go with a piece of paper more or less and go this is what this is what neath wants because they hadn't earned you know, the way of communicating it we're still doing that now so colonizing mars <laughs> i've got to carry it back on i loved it was a a thought experiment and i wanted to sit down with people different people and work out okay if we were going to establish a new state you know somewhere um um we had free reign so we ended up choosing mars because whatever because i don't know mars so the idea is you fly to mars um 50 people for example go up there and they are there and they can establish mars the colony as they want how they want to run it based on what we know now what communication modes of communication we've got now and how we know democracy and different things have worked in the past or not worked right um so when you're saying about uh i think i had a point in the mayor you know, about voting and democracy and and, and 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 people in government representing what the people really want and one of the ideas i had with it which we didn't get on to discussing in a massive way because we got you got stumbled at the first hurdle. I tell you what the question was and ask you what you what you what you think the answer is in closing. Actually, it was okay. How um how how would we vote? I thought all right. So to vote, how about this? You have an app on your phone. Everyone has a phone. Everyone has an app on their phone. And um, Joe Bloggs, who's got a shop on the main road, he wants to have that road widened. Now what happens now at the moment? So now you'd have to put in a request. You know, uh, yeah, put put in a request, get it approved, get it be, be like public consultation to go on for eighteen months, right? Mm -hmm. Because everyone has to be involved, right? So what happens is, not in Hughes' world, not on Mars, right? Your phone goes. So I am that shopkeeper, and I put in, uh, I want to have my road widened by two foot, so I can get lorries in mm -hmm. um, to drop uh, trucks in, drop off whatever, um, and then the pavement can see the same width and all the rest of it. So it puts that request into the voting app or the democracy app, right? Now, through AI and an algorithm, the phone, the, the system immediately notifies all the stakeholders or interested parties or people to be affected by that decision, whatever it is, notifies them. And their phone, like, it could be Mrs. Mabel down the road who, who walks up and down the pavement. It could be a haulage company who transit through it. It could be, um, you know, residents of the roads. So anyone involved in it, right, impacted in a negative way, their phones... Stop doing what they're doing. Get they got two minutes, and they get it. They got two minutes to vote. Two minutes. Should Hugh Keir have his road wide? Road, road, Johnson was his road widened or not? And you go, mm, two minutes for a reason. Minimum time for bribery. Minimum time for corruption. And you're basing your answer on exactly what affects you. Everyone. Missile Mabel goes. I have got no issue with that. Yes. Uh, the local town the re residents go. Pff, no way because all that noise no thanks yeah other businesses go yeah because then i can my vehicles are good so i can send bigger vehicles down i'm all whatever two minutes done that's it the vote is done he, hugh Keir gets his answer on mars he's got a he's got a wider road because mm. they're all the middle one so <laughs> all right waffle right <laughs> my question to you is one of the questions about that colonizing mars big dis big discussion topic on it was 50 people Right, we've got to choose fifty people from the world to go. Mm. Should those fifty people be fifty academic brainiac ninja thinkers, politicians? You know, well, are they the brainiacs? <laughs> politicians, <laughs> academics, um, uh, um, what, what people who study human humans and stuff. You know, those yeah. ologists, ologists, mm -hmm. <laughs> or should the fifty people be from a cross section of society? from the unemployed to the CEO, from um, bricklayers to scaffolders to teachers to university professors, all the way up the cross-section? Oh, good question. I know. It's difficult, isn't it? You know what? I think that society requires lots of different ways of thinking and lots of disagreement. And I think we're better 
when we're fighting and disagreeing because then we get closer to the truth. I think if you got 50 brainiacs together, they might all have very similar worldviews, experiences. I would think the variety would be more important. You need conflict. You need conflict. You need conflict. You need conflict in your, variety, in, 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 in your team. Whatever in that team is. Different whatever big perspectives. Team is. Yeah. That was not the decision we came to. <laughs> really? You came to the Brainiacs? <laughs> no. I was going with what you were saying. And my dad disagreed. And I can't remember how. But we ended up right. All right. It's going to be 50 <laughs> Brainiacs. And that was the end of episode one. Um, what's it? There we go. Any closing words? Advice? Um... What's going to happen? Are we going to are we going to no deal Brexit or deal Brexit? What do you think that feeling? I don't know what's going to happen, but I think what will be important for the future of the country is more than just what the politicians decide, but also what we decide, what we do every day in our businesses, with our families and our friends. And I think I think whether or not this country succeeds will be a lot of it will be down to all the individuals and their choices. And one thing we need to do right now is to stop seeing each other as enemies, leavers, remainers, and start seeing ourselves as friends. We all want, we all want this country to succeed. And I think that's the way that we're going to move forward together. It won't just be down to the politicians in Westminster. It's all of us. Perfect advice. Uh, Chloe Wesley dot... Uh, well, you can find me on Twitter. Twitter. At Love Wesley. Oh, yeah, at Love Wesley. W E S T L E Y. Yes, that's correct. At Love Wesley. Perfect. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been fun.